friends. I am back with part 14 of an excellent book that I read, Be Not Deceived by Roger Curtis. And part 14, chapter 14, deals with the topic of spiritual gifts. And I am just so blessed that um, Roger included this subject in his book because this is a topic that brings such pain, division, and confusion to the church um, that it needs to be talked about. It needs to be discussed with true wisdom. And um, when I read Roger's chapter on this, I could see that it was just written with unspeakable wisdom. And I want to get directly into what he has to say. He says, the word gift is a translation from the Greek word charisma when used in the sense of a spiritual gift. Hence, the charismatic church as a focus on the gifts of the spirit. The first thing um, Roger tries to emphasize is that God gives the gifts. It's not us who receive them as we choose, when we choose, when we want them. He gives the gifts. And, and that's the first focus that Roger wants to get into. He says, the Bible is very clear that the gifts are available to the believer and that they are just what just what it says they are, gifts of the Spirit given to him at his discretion to whom he chooses to provide power from above in the performance of the will of God. They are an anointing from above and can be either temporary or permanent and can consist of one or more of the gifts as are necessary to complete the task assigned. I believe that the reason that we aren't experiencing more of the true gifts today is the lack of holiness and faith in our churches. God does not and never will honor sin. I say true gifts, for I believe that there are many imitations present in today's assemblies. The Apostle John tells us that we need to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Satan has imitated many of the things of God, and the spiritual gifts are no exception. We are warned that he appears as an angel of light, and the imitation of the real thing is one of his wiles. He performs great signs so that even so that he even makes fire come down from heaven to the earth in the presence of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs. That's Revelation 13:13. 13, 13. It is believed and taught by many of our churches that some of the gifts are not for today. They cease to be after the times of the apostles. This is difficult for me to accept, for the gifts were given to the church for operational power. And the more that time passes by, the more the church needs that power. I would think that since the church is still in operation, that the gifts are also. But the point isn't to be argued over to each as he is convinced. The second major concern Roger has is that some churches tend to focus so greatly on one gift, and that gift is a gift of tongues, and, and they put a lot of pressure on, on people who don't speak in tongues. And, and they want them, they almost make them force them to speak, to speak in tongues, and perhaps this is not a gift that this person received. Um, and, and Roger says that um, we shouldn't be emphasizing this lesser gift. We should be focusing on the greatest gift of agape love. Um, Roger says, Gordon Olson was reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11, where it lists the gifts of the Spirit, and he stated, It should be noticed that the gift of tongues is placed near the bottom of the list in the order of importance. In the Romans passage, it is noted, that the gifts will be awarded according to the proportion of his faith. The charismatic church of today has pretty much made the gift of tongues the end and not the means to achieve the end. It's, it's very sad. It, it is of utmost importance to remember that the originator of the gift is the blessed spirit of God working his power and will through the believer. And he is the one in control and not the receiver. Many of today's assemblies are teaching how to receive the gifts, as did the Bible college that I attended. But I find nothing like this in the scriptures. In the first place, the Spirit of God isn't going to award such power to people living with sin in their lives. So holiness is one of the prerequisites. Just because you desire the gifts 
doesn't mean that you're going to get them. The particular calling of the individual believer will determine which gift will be received, for the gifts will never be awarded without a designed purpose. God sort of summed it up in the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In the first three verses in chapter 13, it all returns to the cornerstone of the Christian life, which is agape love. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 2 tells us, If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. This places the gifts in their proper perspective. Love of God in your neighbor is the bottom line, and unless the believer is humbly operating in love, obedience, and faith, he won't be a candidate for any of the spiritual gifts. God's agape love towards his creation is shown by his desire that men would live intelligently and in obedience to his just and righteous commandments, and not for any excellence in their character. This agape was reflected in his giving his son on the cross of Calvary to provide a way for sinful man to reestablish the relationship that his wickedness had broken if man would meet the conditions that God has established. The popular doctrine that God loves the individual sinner is a misrepresentation of what the scriptures actually teach. The true picture of God's relationship with those who refuse to obey him is shown in the fifth in the fifth chapter of psalm where it says for thou art not a god that has pleasure in wickedness neither shall evil dwell in thee the foolish shall not stand in thy sight thou hatest all workers of iniquity paul the apostle warned the church at corinth of the danger of placing too much importance on some of the gifts especially the gift of tongues but to focus instead on agape love, which was far more important. The same warning needs to be issued to many of our churches today, for the issue of tongues has become a major concern, and the tongue talker has been promoted to some sort of a super-Christian. Some even go so far as to assist that one isn't saved if that person doesn't speak in tongues. This is truly dangerous and terrible, claiming that, it is the only evidence of the new birth when we stand before God on that faithful day that lies in everyone's future the question won't be do you speak in tongues the, it, this issue and others like it have created countless denominations many of the disagreements being minor ones until we find a common ground to work together under a united banner of a holy war against a wicked world and its ungodly system, we will continue to be mostly ineffective in our battle. We need to realize that we are losing the war and the world is winning. Maybe if some of our pastors would consent to working together, we could turn some of those 30% filled churches to 70 to 80% full thereby lowering overhead and providing more funding for charity and evangelization at home and abroad. Amen. What wise words. In the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, verses 6 through 8, this reads as follows. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, we have differing gifts. Okay, the third major focus about these gifts is that what are the gifts that we should truly covet and truly desire? This is the next third focus that Roger gets into. The gifts that we should covet are those which will enable us to complete the particular get task that God has assigned to us and not the ones that will enhance our image before men. Our desire should be to look good before God and not to worry about man. The believer should be asking for such gifts that will enable him to fulfill the task that God has entrusted him, to seek and save that which was lost. That's our whole mission in life. This was the example that Christ set before us to follow. And this is the reason that the blessed Spirit of God awards gifts to the believer. As the body of Christ is made up of individual believers, 
each with their separate functions, but working as a whole for the glory of God. The gifts are distributed to different members, but are to be used in unison to promote God's eternal plan. They are never to be used individually to promote the ministry or the notoriety of a particular user. Remember, God will never award such gifts of power to persons seeking their own ends. Only when the receiver of such gifts is completely submitted to God's will, desiring only to bring glory to God and promote His causes, will such gifts be given. And only then, when the Blessed Spirit of God desires a particular work to be done through that person, those gifts that are necessary to accomplish the will of God will be awarded at that time to be used under the direction of the Spirit to fulfill that objective. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 tells us, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. From this passage, it is evident that all believers should be operating in the gifts, but only as the Spirit recognizes the necessity for their awarding. God, in His great wisdom, understands which ministry the believer will be most effective in, and the gifts are awarded accordingly, the Spirit always being the one to determine who receives which gifts and not the receiver. Um, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. Yet, this is in contradiction to what most of the charismatic churches teach, as they tell you that, if you ask in faith, God will give you specific desired gifts. And if you don't receive them, you lack faith. They quote Luke 11, 13. But when you compare the text with Acts 2, 38, 39, it becomes clear that it's talking about salvation, which God lovingly bestows to all who meet his conditions. Sadly, I know of many who have left the faith thinking that God didn't love them because of this erroneous teaching. How sad. Apostle Paul asks a rhetorical question. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 30. It would seem that the common teaching in the charismatic church that all should speak in tongues is highly questionable. The gift of tongues is primarily for the sake of spreading the gospel, that it might be understood by those who spoke in different languages. It is important to know also that faith, biblical belief or heart faith, is another important requirement for the awarding of the spiritual gifts. Both sin and unbelief present in the assembly of the believer will hinder or prevent the working of the gifts. James 1, 6 through 7 says, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. So what an amazing chapter this was. Um, I was so blessed by it, and I hope you were too. Um, you know, the Lord gives gifts as he wills. And the important thing is that we don't get all stressed out if we don't have a certain gift while someone else does. As long as we have agape love, as long as we're seeking to save that which is lost, that's what should be in our heart. For love is the greatest gift of all. Thank you for listening. And next we'll be heading into Roger's last very important chapter. Thank you for listening.